Now, please sing your hymnals to page 334. Come thou font of every blessing, page Father, lead me day by day, verse 134. That's page 482.
Our Heavenly Father, we're glad to be back in your sanctuary. Bless everything that happens here. And I'll take a moment out now just to ask for a special request. My daughter, Jackie, is dealing with a severe migraine headache and has been up all night and went to the emergency room. We pray that you'll be with her and that each of us now will send a prayer up to you. We thank you that we have a God that listens to us, and we ask this all in his name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. We thought that the choir was going to fill all these chairs this morning. We had hopes. We had high hopes that we were going to have all those chairs filled. But in any case, we welcome you this morning to the Chula Vista Seventh-day Adventist Church. Do you have your smiles with you today? Amen. Are you happy in the Lord? Amen. Well, we welcome you here and we pray that God will richly bless you this week. Um, it's nice to see people back that were gone last Sabbath. And... Um, a little bit later on, once more folks are in here, I'd like to introduce you to some new uh, ad- additions to our congregation, at least temporary additions. We have a group of young people here that are doing literature evangelism. Uh, there's just a couple of announcements that I want to uh, emphasize. One is that the nominating committee is going to be meeting on the 23rd of this month, Sunday the 23rd. If you're listed there, Please take a look at that, and please be there uh, June 23 at 11 p.m. in my office. And then um, also we have a board meeting this coming Monday night. So board members, we are going to be meeting at 7 p.m., and we'll meet right over here in the alcove. Thank you, and God bless you. Our hymn of praise this morning will be found in 537. Let's stand up. I believe scripture reading comes before that morning hymn, right? That's, that is All right, that's what I thought. All right, scripture reading this morning comes from Job 36, verses 22 through 26. Behold, God exalteth by his power, who teacheth like him? Who hath enjoined him his way, or who can say, Thou hast wrought iniquity? Remember that thou magnify his work, which men behold. Every man may see it, man may behold it afar off. Behold, God is great, and we know him not, neither can the number of his years be searched out. That's it, I believe.
prepare for prayer. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we bow humbly before you this morning for giving us the opportunity to come unto you, and we're very grateful, Father, for showing your love to each one of us by allowing us to come together this morning to fellowship and to worship together and to bring honor and glory to your name. May we ask for your divine guidance in our service this morning, Father, that the needs of your people individually will be provided. And we are grateful that you know each one of us, our thoughts, our hearts, what is in our mind, our words. You know them, Father. So I pray that you will bless us, that in our coming unto you, that we will be able to present the need that we have that will enable us, Father, to live the life of our Savior and to represent him into this world. And we are grateful for the opportunity that you have provided for each one of us to be, your, to be a co-worker with you. And we are grateful, Father, for the youth who is with us that will bring your message to this community. May your blessing, Father, be upon them. May you provide your protection be upon them day by day. And especially, I pray, Father, for courage and strength to be with them, that they will be able to do your work faithfully, and your blessing will follow. We thank you, Father, for your promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us, and help us that in our walk with you day by day, that we have committed our lives unto you completely, that our life will be transformed into the likeness of our Savior that will enable us to represent you. So I pray for, your, for the services that we uh, bring to you this morning, that it will become a blessing to us and to your people who are still out there, Father, seeking to know you, that we will be able to reach out to them. I pray also for your children that are working at Del Mar right now, mm-hmm. that they will be able, Father, to meet those people that you have prepared for them to meet during the day and be able to represent you to them, Father, that they will be able to see their needs in their physical life as well as their spiritual life. So we thank you again, Father, for your blessing. I pray also for the needs of our members who are not with us, especially that those that have physical problems, Father, may your Holy Spirit will bring comfort to them today in hope that you are there for them, Father, and I pray that you will lay your healing hands upon them and bring them peace and uh, complete uh, surrendering their lives unto you. So we are very grateful, Father, for your many blessings. So now we would like to open our hearts unto you and to fill us with your Holy Spirit, that the message of our pastor that brings to us, Father, will encourage us in our walk with you day by day. Thank you again for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
It's now time for a lamb's offering. So lambs, come on up. We need your help. Somebody to hold this. A great quick volunteer. Thank you. You can stand right there. And all the kids, come on down. And those that have an offering, please raise your hands. And kids, go to those raised hands and pick up the offering. This offering is collected every week at Chula Vista, and it goes towards all of our young people and the programs that we take care of for them here in this church. Way, way in the back, all the way in the back, and over on this side too. Hey, you're, you're good. Hey, you want, to do, you want to do this? You tell them, okay? Don't say someone has an other one. Noah, someone. There's more in the back. That's good. That was a lot of loot. Don't say. Oh. Ask him, is there any more? Ask him, is there any more? Is there any more? Raise your hand. Raise your hand, please. In the back here. And, and, and uh, invite him up for children's story. Say, come down for children's story, kids. Huh? You, say, come down for children's story, kids. Calm down, it's your turn to. Yeah, tell him it's children's story time. Now it's children's story time. Hey, she did pretty good. Give us a break up here. All right, Pastor's got his toys, and he wants to talk to you all about his toys, so make sure that you don't miss out on this. I almost feel like sitting here. Go ahead, Don. You can, you can sit right here. I bet I could, too. Okay, thank you. Hi, kids. Good morning. What's this? What is that? What, is, what do airplanes do? Can this airplane fly? Do you think this airplane could do a loop like that? What does it need? What does it need in order to fly? It needs wings. Does it have wings? Actually, I put this up here so I could put a second wing, and my son pointed out this morning that this will not fly very well because without that second wing, it'd probably just go right into the ground. Yeah, I was going to put two wings on it. Anyway, but that wing's broken now, so I probably will never, never finish this. No, I can't take any passengers in it. But can this airplane fly? What do you think? Should I try it? I can already tell it's way nose heavy. It's just going to go right into the ground. Anyway, do you know what? Could, what does this need to make it fly, to make it work? What? A what? A motor. Yeah, an engine. And I just happen to have one in my pocket. There it is. See that right there? Yeah, that's a, that's a little motor. It works, uh, has fuel. It goes in this little tank. And this one is made so it can fly upside down. Yeah, it can fly upside down. I've done that. It goes up and around. But it won't fly without a motor. It has to have power to make it go through the air, right? Would you like to fly in an airplane? Yeah. How many have ever flown in an airplane? One? Anybody else? Okay, two. Anybody else flown in an airplane? I think it's fun. Anyway, you need a motor in order to fly. What do you need to go to heaven? Wings? You need wings? Will wings get you to heaven? There it is. What is it? What's the answer? It's, say it again. Huh? Jesus. Say it louder. Jesus. That's right. That's what you need to go to heaven. And someday, even though you have not flown yet, you will fly with Jesus to heaven. Amen. So what do you need? Let's say it together. You need Jesus. Don't forget it. You always are going to need Jesus. And if you have Jesus, 
Someday, you're going to take the longest, best flight ever right through space. You're going to go right to heaven. Okay? Don't forget it. But you need what? Jesus. Jesus Jesus is the power that takes you to heaven. Okay. Thank you. It's now time to collect the offering, so I invite the deacons to come down. And today's offering, whatever you put in loose into the plate today, and if you've thought about it in advance and made a plan and you give a certain percentage every week, which is the best way to go, will be collected today. So we're going to uh, thank our God now for what he's done in providing us this church week after week for the generosity he puts in your heart and my heart to give to our church budget so that we can be comfortable in here and have, hold services every week and be able also to deliver the message on the internet. So let's bow our heads now and ask for God's blessing on not only the church budget, but the tithes and any other offerings that you return today. Let's, let's pray now. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for what you give to us, including generosity. Anything good comes from you. So this offering, when it comes today, You can stretch it and you can bless it so that it will go many times further than the actual dollars are that get put into this plate now. We ask that you will continue to give us your mercy and your grace and your spirit within us. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Congregation, this is Andy Villanueva, and he is the leader of a team of literature evangelists. I know you have a different name for your group. What is that name? Uh, We're the Youth Rush. Youth Rush. Yes. All right. I don't know where that comes from. To me, they're literature evangelists. And um, I wonder if you might have your group stand and go through a little introduction of the leaders and everyone involved. Yeah, sure. If you guys could stand up and face the congregation. That's quite a group of young people, huh? Welcome. 
So um, I'm going to pass the mic around, and I want you guys to introduce yourselves as well as where you're from. So we'll start with myself, I guess. That's a good <laughs> uh, idea. My name is Andy Villanueva. I'm actually from Riverside, California. My name is Aureli, and I am from Los Angeles. Hello. Happy Sabbath. My name is Joey Saboro, and I'm from Ontario. Hi, my name is Andrew, and I'm from Yukaipa. Hello. Hi, my name is Jason Daniel, and I'm from Loma Linda. Hi, my name is CJ, and I'm from Loma Linda. CJ, can you tell us what your uh, position is in this group? Oh, I am one of the leaders as well, out of four, for the, and these are my students. Hey, my name is Edgar, and I'm from L.A. My name is Giselle, and I'm from here, from San Diego. I actually attend, well, I grew up in San Diego, Broadway, Spanish church. Hi, my name is John, and I'm also from Riverside. Hi, my name is Francisco, and I'm from the Imperial Valley. Hi, my name is Josh, and I'm from Yucaipa. Hi, my name is Alexis, and I'm from Redlands. Happy Sabbath. My name is Giselle. I'm also one of the leaders, and I'm from El Centro. Hi, my name is Andrew, and I'm from San Marcos. Hi, my name is Lauren, and I'm from San Diego. Hi, my name is Lizzie, and I'm from Sacramento. Hi, my name is Rachel, and I'm from Escondido. All right, that's quite a group of young people. And you know, can I call you kids, because I'm so old? <laughs> you know, kids, I want to have a special prayer for you today, because I really want God to bless you. You know, I was a, once a literature evangelist back in about 1833 or something like that. <laughs> anyway, it was a long time ago. And you know, it was such a blessing. And I, I really hope that you will be as, at least as richly blessed as I would, was with this spiritual experience with meeting people in the Bible studies and, and helping people to, uh, with literature that's going to help them to know Christ better and to be prepared for the last days. And so I've asked two of our elders to come up here. And, you know, why don't we just become one circle here? Can somehow you guys come around and we're going to hold hands together and everybody join us in prayer as we dedicate this literature evangelist team. Father in heaven, we know that your Holy Spirit and bless these young people in such a way that they meet people at doors, that they go into homes, that they lay before them this literature, that you can lead them to just the right people, Father, to open their hearts and their wallets to purchase this material that will later mean the difference between eternal life and eternal loss. And so, Father, bless them abundantly with your Holy Spirit, heavenly angels protecting them and guiding them door to door. And we ask this for Jesus' sake, Father. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Okay. Well, we're thankful for these brave young people to come and work with us Amen. here. Amen. So I would like you to get acquainted with them, support them. And at the same time, we will be able to work together, pray for them. Right now, we will be uh, favored with uh, worship and music that will bring to, uh, be brought to us by our young people here, Leah Aligado and Aranza Valdez. and I are going to be sharing with you today it ties in a little bit to Pastor's story this morning. It's all about Jesus, and really, when you come to think about it, there is none like him. So our song today is entitled, There is None Like You.
Thank you very much. Let's pray. Father in heaven, there is none like you, and as we open thy word, as we humbly talk about you and who you are, please give us a sense of how great you are and how much you want us to Reveal yourself to us. And yet, how limited we are in understanding. For Jesus' sake, amen. You see, there's no way that we could ever exhaust this, this subject. I remember last time I asked you, and you told me this is what you wanted to hear. At least some of you are new here today, so you weren't part of that decision. But today we're going to talk about the Godhead. There is a word that we hear, have heard all, probably all our lives, the Trinity. Some people are uncomfortable with that word. And uh, it's probably because of the, the history of the, the development of the doctrine and the involvement in the, of the imperial uh, government of Rome in the decision making and, you know, and so forth. But the question is, did, they may have come up, with a, come up with it in a wrong way or maybe... It, it, it's the way they came up with is questionable, but did they come up with the truth? Okay, and uh, whether they did or not, uh, that's for you to say. I, I kind of tend to think they did. But Godhead is probably a more acceptable term this day, this day and age. I don't know if you know it, but there's a great debate going on over the Trinity in, Christ, in Christian world today. You know that? Even in our church, this is being thrown back and forth. Is there a trinity? Is there not a trinity? What is, you know, what's the role of the Holy Spirit? Um, is, is the Holy Spirit really God? Is he really an individual? And so forth. Well, the Godhead. You know what's interesting? I came across this as I was doing a little research. Hinduism has its own Godhead. You see those pictures? There's three of them there that show a, a, uh, an image that has three heads on one body, sort of a godhead, if you will. And then those same individuals, they call them uh, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, are separated out. So it's like the three are one, but the one are three. Now, this is not an idea that's really, uh, from what I can tell, very popular in India. It's not a widely held doctrine, but it is there. And you can see it, it is in the, uh, the imagery that they have. And I, have, I want to start off with this question that I think is helpful, believe it or not. 
why would we see this in this non-Christian, non-Judeo-Christian religion? Well, we know that Satan is always trying to do what? Copy God. He's, he was there. He was in heaven. He saw what God was. He heard from the Father about the divinity of the Son. Jesus Christ is God. You know, he, he knows that there's a trinity, is what I'm saying here. And so he, made an, he, he inspired people to make images of a trinity. And over and over and over and over again in the, in the non-Christian religions of the world, they have flood story traditions, they have uh, stories about virgin births, right? Okay. Over and over again, you see this sort of a, a copying of what God would do or did. Why? Isn't it because he wants to take the place of God? He wants something on earth to take the place of the true God, and so he, he, he makes something that's like God as much as he can, an image in the image of God as much as he can. Perhaps this is why the commandment says, the second commandment says, don't make any images. Because God wanted to get rid of this tendency or this, this ability of Satan to bring confusion. And speaking of confusion, now what do people do when they look at something like this? There are some people that will look at this and they'll say, see, Christianity is just copying Hinduism. It's Trinity. It really is based upon a pagan religion. And so it gets all confused. He gives credit to, to uh, have you ever heard that they, they give credit to, uh, um, oh no, now it's escaping me. Any, anyway, the, the Ten Commandment Law, they say, well, that was Hammurabi, that's who it is. Hammurabi's Law is the basis of the Ten Commandments. I've heard that for years since I was in college. Believe it or not, I was that young one, one day. Yeah, man. But, The neat thing about that is, to me anyway, it suggests that this is the truth. That is, it suggests that Satan saw it, he copies it, and therefore it gives us an indication that that what we hear about God, what we read in the Bible, is actually true because he's copying it. Okay, that's kind of roundabout reasoning, but let's get on now with what we're really about here this morning. Who is God? We can never exhaust that, but we focused on one question. Why is God one but three? Let's do a little review. Um, Let's do a little background as we lead up to that answer to that question, at least my own personal answer to that question. Matthew 28, 19, what does it say? Go out into all the world. All authority is given unto me. Go out into all the world and baptize in the name of, of who? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And you know, that, that, those three are found together in Scripture over and over. You know, in the same verse, you'll see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Not necessarily by those names. I'll share with a couple of those with you in a, here now. Okay? In 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, To God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling by his blood. And so you have that, that trinity there in those two verses. And you see that again. Jesus actually expresses it himself in John 14, verse 26. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. There it is again. Expressed a little different, but nevertheless, there it is. Now the fact that Jesus 
wants us to be baptized or said, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, to me, that's an indication that they are understood to be equal, that he is laying at the very foundation of Christianity, the, the, the entrance, the act where you, by, whereby which you enter into his family, whereby you become a child of God, where you, you, you show that, that you are in faith trusting God to bring about a new you. You're going to be born again is to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that, to me, shows the importance of this doctrine. And the fact, again, that they are on equal plane with one another. They are associated together, the same divine level. Is the Holy Spirit God? We call Jesus Lord, don't we? We refer to God the Father as Lord. Well, in 2 Corinthians 3.17... Now the Lord is the Spirit. The rest of the verse says, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There's something so interesting about God, and that is that he knows everything. But by what means does he know everything? Psalm 139, Psalm 139, verse 1. O oh Lord, you have searched me. I'm going to read from the, the, the um, Amplified Version, by the way. You have searched me thoroughly and have known me. You know by my down-sitting and my uprising. You understand my thought far off. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're doing. He's searched you. Verse 3. You sift and search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. By what means is he acquainted with all your ways? For there is not a word in my tongue, still in your tongue, maybe not even expressed yet. But behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You have beset me and shut me in behind and before. He's all around you. He's all around us. And by the way, you can read this. It's not just David. This is not just David. This is When you read this, you're reading your experience. This is the way it is with, between you and God. You have, again, shut me in behind me and before me. You have laid your hand upon me. Your knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high above me. I cannot reach it. If I ascend into, up into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, that is the grave, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning or dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall your hand lead me, your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the night shall uh, light be light about me. Wait a minute. And the night shall be light about me. For e even the darkness hides nothing from you, but the night shines as the day, and darkness and light are both alike. Look at verse 7 again. Where can I go from what? Your spirit. God's spirit is everywhere. You can't hide. You can't go to a place where he doesn't see you. You can't have a thought that he doesn't know. You can't utter a word that he doesn't hear. You don't hear a thing that he's not hearing with you. You can't lay a plan that he doesn't know beforehand what you're planning or as you're planning it. There's nothing about you that God doesn't know, and it's all by his, by his Spirit. But does the Holy Spirit, is he a person? I think he has the attributes of personhood. I'm just going to show you one verse here about that. It shows that the Holy Spirit makes choices like any individual would. 1 Corinthians 12, 4. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Second, 1 Corinthians 12, and now I'm at verse 6. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now, who does it? The same God. 
Okay, verse 11. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He, He, gives them to each one just as He determines. So the Holy Spirit determines. He makes decisions. He has a will, just like an individual. So yes. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three co-eternal persons, always have been, always will be, equal, and yet, and one, and yet three. Do you know what the word comprehend means? If you comprehend something, what does that mean? You know, its ultimate meaning is, is more than just understand. Let me read something to you, a definition of it. When you comprehend something, you grasp its meaning. Comprehend is a verb that originates from the Latin word comprehender, which means catch, to catch or seize. So it's something that you have. You've got a hold of it. I've got it. You know, that's what we say when we, when, you know, when we understand something. Okay, I got it, right? But let me read on. When an idea is clear to you and you understand it completely, you comprehend it. Completely. Then you understand it. We can never comprehend God because we can never understand or know him completely. The man who thinks that he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. As soon as you think you know something, you know, you really don't. He who directs, excuse me, let's go to Isaiah 40, verse 13. He who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or be, wait a minute, who, yeah, there you go. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or been his counselor? There again, you have this indication that the Spirit is a person, counselor or taught him. Verse 14, with whom took he counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment and taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding. Behold, the nations are as a drop in the bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. God is without need of any advice. God is without any need of any teaching. None can teach him because he knows everything already. Creation is small, a tiny bit of dust. But God is huge. Everywhere, as a matter of fact. And yet, even though he is incomprehensible, he wants you to know him. Psalm 103, verse 7. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. And so God tells us about himself through the prophets. He wants us to know him. And so he gives us the Bible. He gives us the prophets. They write these things down and they share their knowledge of God with us because he really does want to be known. He's incomprehensible, but he wants us to understand something of him. At least, you know, there's, there's a certain amount about him that he needs you to know. He wants you to know. We're like dust. He fills the heavens. And all creation, his wisdom, knowledge, and being are infinite. It's like a, an ever-growing circle. It's like, um, and you know, there's something else I want to, I guess I'll go to right now. It has to do with what you see on the screen. What is that thing? Screw. Is that a screw? Now, there's somebody here probably that knows exactly what it is. I see one hand. Unfortunately, he hasn't said it. <laughs> you know, if, if he leaned over, though, and he told, whispered that in his wife's ear, or your ear, and say he whispers that in your ear right now, 
is Jim. Jim knows what it is. And he tells you what that thing is. You know, if you knew the name, you wouldn't really necessarily know what it does or its, in, you know, its function. In order to understand it, you need to know what it comes from and how it operates within that whole thing. And in fact, once you know what it is and sort of what it does with the whole thing, then we come to this. How can you really appreciate that one little part that you see on the screen unless you understand completely the whole thing? And what I'm driving at is we may come to a, a little bit of knowledge about who God is, but do we really appreciate and understand that one little bit of understanding and knowledge unless we understand all there is to know about God? Because there, there's doubtless there's something about God that reflects back upon that one little thing that helps us understand it better. Ah, no, you didn't follow that, did you? <laughs> you did. Somebody did. In any case, what I, all I'm trying to say is, is that God is just amazing and beyond our understanding. So you're, you're still wondering, what is that thing? Is he going to tell me? Sometimes I tell you things and then I don't, you think I don't finish the story. So this time I'm going to finish the story. That is called a needle valve. Now, does anybody know what it does now? Needle valve. There you go. You see it on that little airplane engine right there? See it right back behind the, the cylinder? It's that little thing sticking down. And that's how you adjust the, the mixture you know, of the engine. You adjust that just right, and they get maximum, you know, RPM out of that little engine. So it's kind of like, I guess if you drive a car, it's kind of like the, the gas pedal, let's say. Not really, but it's, you know, think of it that way. On the old carbureted engines, there was a needle valve that adjusted the mixture on the carburetor. Jim knows all about that. Anyway, you don't really understand what that needle valve does unless you understand what the engine does. And you don't really understand the engine, what the engine does without the needle valve. I don't know. Anyway, let's move on. Look at it like this. I don't know why that got misshapen on this computer, but it sure did. Those are supposed to be perfectly round. All right, look at that. You see those little dashes there over it says equals five questions about God. So you start off, you know, and you think, how many questions can I think of to ask about who God is. And so you write those five down. And then you ask somebody that knows. Ask Moses. Ask Jesus. Ask you know, anyone who knows. And they give you an answer. You get the answers to all those questions. But you know what happens? Then that leads to other questions about God. Let's see if we can think of something here. I'm just, this is off the top of my head. I don't know if my brain's going to work right now uh, well enough to to uh, come up with these, but let's see. Um, okay, God is love. Or the question is, is God love? And somebody says, yes, God is love. Does that lead to more questions? How many more? Well, could, all right, Sarah, you thought of one. What is it? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. How does he love? Who does he love? When does he love? Why does he love? Whoa, look at that. One question led to four. So you, you, can, you, you can actually compound those questions. And they, you, the more you know, is a circle, your circle of understanding, as we pointed out before, if, if those dots, those circles with, with dashes, I mean, each of them represents a question. And once you get the answer to those, it leads to more questions, and still more questions, and still more knowledge that you'd like to have, that there are answers to about God. And what I'm telling you is the circles never stop with God. It just goes on and on and on and on. Job 36, 22, God is exalted in his power who is a teacher like him? Who has prescribed his ways for him or said to him, you have done wrong? 
Remember to extol his work. Remember to extol his work. You can never say, young people, old people, everyone, children, you can never say something too good about God. You can never say enough to praise him. You can never exaggerate about the greatness, the glory, the wonder, the love of God. Remember to extol his works, which men have praised in song. All mankind has seen it. Men gaze on it from afar. How great is God beyond our understanding. One translation says, Job 36, 26, beyond our understanding. We will never, ever, ever comprehend God. Yet, God wants to be known as much as we can. He wants us to know him. And so how has he revealed himself to us? This is your turn. How has he revealed himself to us? Through, his, through the Bible, yes. What, what else? I think I heard it. Creation through nature and through his word. He has re, he's revealed himself. But even these are limited, right? There's only so many words for an infinite God. There's only so much nature out there for an infinite God. Dreams? Did I hear dreams? Okay. He reveals him. He wants to reveal himself. There's one more way that God reveals himself, and that's through his person, who he is. You see, that's the answer to why he's three and one. God wants you to know him. He's always wanted his creation to know him. That's where we're going to end. He's, he wants you to know him, and yet he's incomprehensible. <clears throat> <clears throat> and so he manifests himself in three persons so we might get a handle on who he, who he is. <clears throat> the Father, the highest in rank or authority, paramount, sovereign. Sinners fear him. He loves them, but they fear him. And then there's the Son, the ambassador, the mediator, the medium or agency or means through which God carries out his plans, communicates in person his will, his love. Sinners are attracted to and comforted by the presence of Jesus. So sinners come to, to Jesus. God the Father on the throne. Let me, let, me, let me put it this way. You have a God who is the, the highest authority. He is the king. And yet he wants to be near you. He wants to come and sit down right beside you in the pew here and worship with you. That's what Jesus did with his disciples. They went to the synagogue together. They sat together, I'm sure of it. Do you think I'm wrong? Do you think he sat with his disciples? He wants to sit with you. He wants to physically be right there with you. And yet he's the, he's the glorious king, you know, sitting on the throne. But he wants to be near you. And so in order to, to do both, he is both. And then there's the Holy Spirit. He is the medium or agency or means by, through which God is present with all his subjects, speaks personally to all his subjects, comforts and empowers all his subjects at the same moment. And so sinners, let's point out the differences, when sinners see God sitting high on his throne, what did Isaiah do? He says, whoa, I'm undone. When sinners see the Father on the throne, they fear him. When they see Jesus, they come near him. And when the, when the Holy Spirit is there, he is there to be the representative of God who is everywhere and always is near them. Let's put it this way. The Father is somewhere, the Son is every excuse me, the Holy Spirit's everywhere, and the Son is wherever. Here's what I mean. The Father is somewhere. He's seated on a throne in his kingdom. 
in heaven. The Holy Spirit is everywhere, unconfined, unhindered. The Son, he's wherever the Father needs him to be. Another way of looking at it, the Father rules all personally, the Holy Spirit schools all personally, and the Son loves all personally. Now how can one being, it's kind of like, this is something I use often, is that, you know, it's hard to be a parent and be a friend to your children. In fact, in fact, a lot of people say, don't try to be the friend of your children. You've got to always be the parent of your children. Because parents sometimes have to say, no, don't do that. You know, sometimes we have to discipline our kids. And your friends don't discipline you, you know. They don't just say, all right, you've got to sit on your bed for half an hour. You ever had any friends do that? Huh? No, it's hard to be the friend and yet the parent. And, and so anyway, a similar situation exists with us and God. He wants us to know him as someone who's everywhere, someone who's wherever God wants him to be or wherever we are, and yet somewhere located on a throne in heaven. You get that? I think that's why you have a trinity. One, but three. He's really one. But in order for us to understand him, to appreciate, to love him, to honor him, to know him, he reveals himself in three persons. Before sin appeared, the same desire existed in God's heart. And there in, um, there in heaven... What were the angels like? Did I miss the text here? I did, but anyway, here's the point. The, the Bible says that in comparison to God, we are like grasshoppers. You ever come across that? Look it up in a concordance. And when a grasshopper is sitting there, when I was a kid, there was a lot of grasshoppers and ants up there in Ukiah, you know, I'd go to school and I'd see the grasshoppers in the spring, you know, and the ants. The grasshoppers sitting there on the ground, what does he know about me? Does he know I'm even there? He might fear me, so he knows, yeah, he knows I'm there sometimes. He hops away. Do they have grasshoppers down here? Are there grasshoppers in San Diego? I haven't seen a lot of them. Okay, they're grass. All right. So the grasshopper may hop away. So he might fear me, but does he know me? Can he know me? No. We are like grasshoppers, but you know what? The angels were, were similar with God. And so he manifests from the very beginning all of, for all of creation. He has manifested himself as three persons in order that, that we might know him and love him and appreciate him. And you know what? Going back to this un incomprehensibility of God, you know, that's one of the most interesting and kind of wonderful things about God. It makes him so interesting because forever we will never stop learning about who he is. The circles of the questions will never, ever stop. You'll never run, you'll never be bored in heaven. Because in terms of intellectually, there will always be something about God, more to learn. And, there, and as far as, you know, what you're doing with your time, other than uh, meditating on who he is, there'll never stop being things to do. And maybe one of the reasons why is we have a wonderful, awesome God that will never... Stop giving us new things to experience and do. He's a great God. Amen. And I don't know, I hope that I've helped kind of not only maybe explain why it might be that he is one but three, but that you will perhaps appreciate how wonderful he is just a little more for having spent this time together. So 
Please meditate on that as Aransa sings, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all unrighteousness and saves us from our sins. Thank you that he did not pass us by. He came in here to this earth to live and die for each one of us. And thank you for the Holy Spirit that comes near to us and does not pass us by. Thank you for being so patient and kind with us. We worship you, Father, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.